So what I'd like to talk to you all about today is redefining pathways to freedom. I want you to think about environmental alchemy as a concept and a reality when we're talking about who we are. We are made of 78 minerals, 23 elements, 8 to 10 gallons of water on a good day. Because, <laughs> you know, the hydration can be a real thing. And all of that supports 30 trillion cells and 38 trillion bacteria. So we are literal microcosms. We are walking microcosms, and we have a great deal of responsibility to take care of ourselves, and how we take care of ourselves and the environment around us is reflected in our public health, our spiritual health, and our planet's health. One of the things that really inspires me um, as an artist, I'm a visual artist, I'm a mother, I'm a woman. I'm a woman who um, is deeply connected to my ancestry. And one of the things that happens when you begin to hear your ancestors and step in their footsteps is you have the Sankofa experience. The image that looks like a heart, that is a heart, is deeply rooted. It's rooted in the ancestral lineage that I carry and many of us carry still, that is rooted in West Africa. This specific symbol is an Adinkra symbol from the Akam people. And it signifies being in the present moment, looking backwards to remember and to bring forth the lessons, the knowledge, the wisdom, also the mistakes and the challenges that were resolved or unresolved to the present time, this very moment, and then also looking forward to the future. So it really signifies this complicated alchemy of circular time. Most of us were taught that time was linear, right? Like, it was just a straight line and all these things happen. But in actuality, for me, in the way that I think, in my inner world, it's circular. I have, just like our planet's orbit, they're all, it's all circles. We look at nature, it's circles. So thinking about how we can recirculate our own ancestral wisdom and apply that to systems in the world. This is a piece that I created a few years ago, and it's, it's called Sankofa, but it's really about facing ourselves. What, how are we leaving this planet? How are we leaving, what are we leaving behind that can improve and reflect the kind of world we want to all be living in? Because we're human. For me, being human means having responsibility and understanding where I come from, understanding my ancestors, and how much they were able to overcome, and how we can all overcome the challenges that are in front of us as humanity, because we're, we're on the brink of a crisis, a climate crisis. And for me, I can't just have a problem and be like, woe is me, I, I gotta get in it. Um, I gotta get in it in a serious way and try to figure out how I can bring my gifts forward. What is the North Star, what is the drinking gourd to find pathways to freedom. And of course, Harriet Tubman, there was many Harriets. The Underground Railroad was a network, a mycelium network, of people who all were looking towards freedom. And continue to this day, we create pathways to freedom. So Chicago is, has a, an amazing motto, which I, when I first started this work, I didn't, I didn't know. Um, I was uh, 18, 1987, moved to Chicago to go to art school. This is North President's Court. If you look, if you can kind of look past those trees, it's the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And that is where I went to art school. I had no intention of being a farmer or growing food in the city. It was the last thing on my mind. But a few years later, this opportunity came up, and our city's motto really resonated with me, herbs and hordo, which means city in a garden. So to me, if you have a city that has garden in its motto, then we, of course, should have gardens everywhere. We should have these beautiful places where people can come and see their home native foods being grown, remember our heritage and food pathways, but also for young people to grow up seeing and understanding where food comes from. When young people have these opportunities, especially young people whose ancestry may have been exploited by the agriculture system, let's be real was exploited to build the wealth of this country, and that we, as black people, have never had the access to that wealth, the agency around that wealth. 
and have had our talents exploited for the well-being of folks who used to own us. These are things that take a long time to heal and to rectify. And that is what we can do when we reclaim things. We take the thing that was weaponized and return it to why it's important, why it built our economic system. So this is an image of Malcolm, who's now a farm director. He's a scientist, he's a farmer, and he is, was third generation living in Cabrini Green. So understanding that the pathway to freedom, this environmental alchemy, transforms lives. We also need to understand where and how the earth works. So a young person who's introduced to this early, the Malcolms of the world, to understand that these worms, these Asenia fetida, these red wigglers, and they literally wriggle around, they're constantly eating the decomposed uh, waste from nature, whether it's leaves, whether it's, you know, just anything that is of organic in nature, that these worms can be harnessed to actually create fertility. And in their gut, they're breaking down both the nutrients to make them available again to plants, but also pathogens. They eat their weight daily. So understanding this, this is, this is work that my dad um, perfected and, and worked a lot on and taught thousands of people how to do this. You're able to actually create food systems that are self-sustaining. And in an urban setting, peri-urban or rural, you need fertility. And without fertility, you can't have these aha moments. That aha moment of a city kid who's never been downtown Chicago, although born and raised until their first job in Grant Park, having that experience of pulling a carrot out of the ground and under, like, understanding this grows from, from this dirt? Because that's, that was, that's not in all of our neighborhoods. We haven't all had those experiences. And many of us have had, as I've shared already, an exploitive relationship with the land. So also having spaces where we can heal. Liminal spaces, sacred groves, where we can come together and reestablish our relationship with plants to understand their medicinal qualities and just reconnect to ourselves. Environmental alchemy. Spaces to breathe and exhale, to let our inner and outer world out so that we're able to grow and create new economies, transparent economies, and freedom. If I don't know how wealth is being created within my community, or I am contributing to a system that I know is harming somebody maybe in my community, maybe somewhere on the other side of the world, that's not sustainable, that's not regenerative, and that is not green. And with climate change, we have to look at all the systems that have got us to this point that have exploited nature and her resources for profit. I call it ratchet economics, and that's actually a term. <laughs> you know, if you're a ratchet, um, it's, it doesn't, at this stage, we need to, we need to generate capital. We don't need to do it by exploiting people or nature. I believe that we can generate resources without redlining, excluding communities. Chicago is the birthplace of redlining. Auburn Gresham, which is the community that Green Era is located in, this is where this was birthed. It was also where we had the first COVID death. So the reality of working with the land is not so far off. Guess which of these images is real and which one's AI? I mean, you can kind of tell. It's not like a total, <laughs> totally like a hard one. But I created, I co-created, because I'm not afraid of the technology. I'm just cautiously cautious and optimistic, but cautious. Um, I put in a lot of words, urban ag, food justice, um, climate change, um, you know, livable cities. And this is the image that came up. And what struck me is that it looks a lot like the image of our South Chicago farm which is on Park District land, so it's farming for Chicago. So we're on the right track. We know we have to grow food closer to our cities. There's going to be challenges like there are right now. I had to hightail it out of Atlanta to get here and you know, beat a, a, a hurricane. And there's more and more of these weather events that are coming. And so it's important that we're able to do things like this. This is a low-tech, high-tunnel that we grow food in year-round. We've been doing it for years on asphalt, on depleted land using materials you can get at Home Depot. The reason we can do this is because of that soil. When I first started this work, I had to bring it down in a box truck full of ammonia, because it was a lot of ammonia being released from this very dense 
uh, compost that was being made anaerobically without oxygen, but so dense that we can grow food really close together. But you need a lot of it, a lot of biomass. So we started thinking, how can we have a center that can generate capital without exploiting people in nature, to not contribute to climate change, to divert food out of landfills, because landfills, when that food waste breaks down, releases methane into the atmosphere and into the lungs and the bloodstreams of our neighbors who live in southeast Chicago and other EJ communities, environmental justice communities, who should be focusing on creating new worker co-ops and all these amazing models to support wealth creation and stability. Instead, we're fighting to not have more pollutants that harm our, our bodies and our communities. So it was important to me not just to grow food, but figure out how to create a system that could do multiple things at the same time and also generate capital. So this, this was the first high-solid two-phase digester that my dad and his buddy Mark created up in Milwaukee with growing power. I was so inspired by this. I'm not an engineer. I'm an artist who works in the fifth dimension with living things and social systems and all that. But I, I understood that this is something, if we were able to have energy and we were able to generate our own energy, we could, and to create energy not just fuel, but energy in the soil, because that is a form of energy. I'm always thinking about agency and food sovereignty, because the what if, ha if the what if, you know, what if this happens, what if that happens? Um, that emergency, that anxiety about um, hunger and about um, disasters. What if we had to feed ourselves if there was a disaster? So we need to have these closed loop systems. We need to be able to create energy, not just for our homes and, and power and that kind of energy, but also energy in the soil. Most of our um, fertility is imported, um, and historically it's been um, produced in the Ukraine. So with the war, this was a huge concern, um, just for conventional ag, that this fertilizer was no longer being, being, being made because there's a war. But also, it, it begs the question, why are we bringing in fertility from the other side of the world when we can create our own? So closing this loop, being able to actually generate energy through food waste, to be able to bring food that's going to landfills into a facility that is negatively pressurized, which is a fancy way to say the funk stays inside so you don't smell it, because it's very funky, that this material is being pulverized. This is all food waste that would have gone to a landfill. We also um, have a lot of food that comes from food banks, so dented cans and food that's not fit for human consumption anymore needs to also be processed. So why not bring it to Green Era? Because this is going to produce revenue. It's impacting public health. It's taking this material and reusing it over and over again. So essentially, it's perpetual energy. And it's something we can all participate in. It's not some far off thing. It's literally taking your banana peel, your, your kitchen scraps, after you make that delicious salad, or whatever you're making, your, your, your pork chop bones, whatever, and to be able to recirculate that to grow more food. Then we have a closed loop system, and we essentially have perpetual energy. This also contributes directly to um, decarbonizing our fuel system. We want to not be dependent on petroleum-based um, power. We want to be able to move away from that. But with all things that we point our finger at that we don't want anymore, we have to have a solution. So being able to harness that methane, and if I haven't said it yet, I will say it now, each and every one of you produces quite a bit of methane every day, because you're a carbon-based life form, and that is methane. The toot toot, that's what that is. <laughs> so all we're doing here is capturing this before it, it, it's released into the atmosphere. And then we can take this material. It's actually really strong. It's hard to just directly grow without a lot of water. So we can actually stretch it and make even more fertility and beds to grow food. This is transformative. And it also creates a revenue center that's not exploiting people or the environment. Because we want to live in a city and a garden and herbs and hordo, and be able to train, educate, enchant everybody to be part of the food system. 
whether you're growing basil on your porch or you're growing a whole hoop house full of delicious greens, you want to be able to do that knowing that you're not harming somebody else and that you're feeding yourself what you think you're eating. I know this material has the building blocks of life. I know it has enough energy to be able to fuel our bodies and to mitigate the challenges of our atmosphere. So remember, we are made of our mother, that I'm kind of standing on right now, I'm standing on this dot, so not totally, but that we're, we're connected to the earth, we're connected to the universe, that outer world. We're made of the same things. We're all connected. We have an opportunity to transform our world. Will you join me? Will you become a visionary and a food system warrior? Thank you.